Amen. I need to get right into really the word today, and I do. Uh, I'm going to have a lot of scriptures to share, and and uh, when I give the the subject, you'll find out why. I just really want the Bible to speak for itself today, and I really want to speak a lot just from the Word, uh, which I do normally, and I think any preacher does, but uh, I think everybody understands. So uh, because we read today some scriptures and go over a lot of scriptures, um, I feel like it will be a little bit um, uh, kind of a, as far as time. Some of you know I try to to watch the time, but uh, how many know we're just going to take a few moments and get into God's Word? And besides, last week I was uh, uh, five minutes shorter, so I can be five minutes longer this week. I'm just kidding. Playing with you. Um, anyways, I, I want to just, before I share scripture, we're going to continue on our series, Living Under the Influence, but um, I just want to throw out something this morning that before I share, and I have to make this clear, that this morning I'm not going to share this uh, sermon today or this message out of fear. It's not coming out of uh, coercion. I'm not trying to uh, scare anybody and, and intimidate, or I'm not sharing out of a heart of pride or fear or anger. Um, we need to make sure that whatever we share from the Word of God, from truth, and maybe even the hard sayings of Jesus need to be done with love, I believe, with, with boldness and great joy. Can you say amen? And so today, I, I want to just say that before we get into what we're going to talk about today, but I want to talk to you, continue the series on living under the influence of the end. Turn with me to John chapter 3, verse 16, 17. Then I'm going to turn over and read from Matthew chapter 13. But in John chapter 3, we read John 3, 16 last week and how much God loved us and did for us. But in verse 17, it says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Jesus. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Amen. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 13, if you'll just turn over to Matthew 13, back to Matthew 13. Jesus is giving a long discourse and a lesson, um, a powerful lesson, and I encourage you to read the whole thing. But in Matthew chapter 13, He's ending this sermon and I believe it was started out calling the, serm, the sower and the seed, but he begins to talk about um, to the Pharisees and begins to address their heart and begins to address um, their condition. And he says, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 41, verse 41, he says, The Son of Man will send His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 43. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. How many believe that those that are living under the influence of the end understand the reality of hell? Amen. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Paul goes in and he says, I, I want to... I'm not going to lay again the foundations, and he begins to list the foundations of the Christian faith. He, and and uh, the last two are resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And he says this, he says that these are the foundational truths of the Christian faith. Or he writes and he says the doctrines of Christ. Hebrews chapter 6 says these are the doctrines of Christ. That these are the teachings and the, and the foundational teachings of the Christian faith. And did you know eternal judgment is one of those? So it's not something that we talk about on the side and it's not something we make up to scare people into the church and they need to behave themselves and they need to straighten up and they need to become good Christians. It's part of the foundational truths of the Christian faith. Do you believe that? Right? In fact, the Bible continues and, and, and constantly is talking about hell. It talks about eternal death. It talks about these things. Well, we're going to talk about it here in a moment. But just in the New Testament, there's over 160 references to hell. Jesus himself gave over 70. And he taught them. He referenced them. He, he spoke about them. He described hell itself. See, this subject is very uncomfortable this morning. I understand that. Very uncomfortable for anybody in any age. Someone said, well, back in the 50s, they talked about it all the time and everybody shouted. No, it was uncomfortable then. And when Jesus talked about it, it was uncomfortable. Why? Because it's real. It's real. Those that are living under the influence of the end understand the reality of hell. There's a reality. How many believe that? It's a reality. And it's real. And so, so many times when we read the Bible and we, I'm reading scriptures and I'm going through scriptures of, of, that describe hell and talk about hell, 
I, I find myself looking through American eyes and our cultural context, putting things in cultural context, and even my old nature perspective. How many know we have to read the Word of God as it is written, and we have to read it by faith? And whatever it says, we have to say, God, it's your word. And because I love you, I love your word. And because I trust you, I have to trust your word. Even if it's things that make me uncomfortable, I don't understand. Why, why is it that when we talk about eternity, and especially, especially talk about eternal uh, uh, death, uh, we feel uncomfortable? Why is that? I feel two things. First of all, because we begin to understand the reality. We begin to get it. We begin to see it. You, you perceive something. Something sparks and you begin to get it. How many know when you begin to talk about eternity, uh, there's something that actually sometimes scares you? I remember as a little kid, people talking about the end times and I was scared half to death. Amen. I mean, I ran up, you know, at the altar like halfway through the sermon. I was so scared. I didn't know what to do, right? How many were there? Any other scared church kids? Yeah, okay, great. I was there, right? And, and so what happens is the other thing is, is why, why do we get afraid or why we get uncomfortable is because it's normal. It's normal because we don't understand it. It's normal because we, it's out of our control. It's mysterious to us. We can't control it. And anything we don't like to control, we don't like, at period. If it's not, if, doesn't, if we can't control it, and we don't have anything to, oh, I can't control it. How many know that? It's bigger than us. Eternity is bigger than us. And so we kind of get weird about it. And, you know, I believe that sometimes I could give a hundred scriptures about faith and love, and everybody or most people would agree. But I give one scripture on it, hell, and the next thing you know, we got a bunch of skeptics and cynical people, right? Well, I don't trust that guy, you know. There he goes, fire and brimstone. There it is right there. But we've got to realize that it's part of the reality of the Christian faith and of life itself. And so really those that are afraid and ashamed or even hesitate to speak about eternity really don't know God and they don't love people. Is that right? You just don't know God. Because if you understand God, you understand that God's plan is so much bigger than ours. God's started out with God so loved the world. We shout right there and sing for joy. But when we get to the part that says that we would not perish, <laughs> and whoever doesn't believe in Him will perish, then we kind of start singing the woes and, wait a second, that's really the dark side of Christianity. How many know there's all light? Amen. It's all good. Amen. And so, you know, you, you understand this. And so when we preach that hell is not literal, and when we talk about, you know, well, Jesus really doesn't judge sin, then what happens is salvation becomes physical, not spiritual. It's something that I can believe in. I can believe in your God and not necessarily convert to Christianity or convert to the Lord. You know what I mean? I can believe in that. I could believe in your religion, but not necessarily believe in God myself. And so that's why we have to be careful that we do believe in what the Bible teaches as hell. And we do, we do talk about it because it is a reality. How many believe it's a reality? It's a, a reality. Let me just say this quote and move on. Anything that keeps us from the realities of hell will eventually keep us from the urgency of the mission. Let me say it one more time. Anything that keeps us from the realities of hell will eventually keep us from the urgency of the mission. Jesus was so passionate about the mission. At 12 years old, He was ready to take over the world. He was so passionate about His mission. He was so passionate about dying for the sins of the world that at 12 years old, He was amazing the lawyers of His day. Come on, He was urgent about it, wasn't He? Jesus didn't say, well, I don't want to really, you know, I don't want to hurt people, I don't want to offend people. I mean, Jesus moved in the greatest evangelist of our, of our every of history, I should say, moved in the greatest love. Amen? And yet the greatest truth. Let me share with you four, the, four realities of hell by sharing with you this scripture. Turn with me to Luke chapter 16, 19 and 31. Now, again, I'm going to read this and, and uh, as people that went through the growth track uh, this morning realized, I can read really fast. So I'm going to try to be, uh, I can't talk as fast as Brother Micah, but I can read faster. No, I'm just kidding. I always get on him. He talks fast. But um, that's just the way we do around here in Pennsylvania. We talk really fast sometimes. Did anybody know that? If you're ever from the South and you came up here, you're like, whoa, these people just need to slow down. <laughs> right? Yeah. Luke chapter 16 in verse 19, Jesus said, and this is the best way I could do it was read the scripture. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who was feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came 
and licked his sores. So he was a homeless person. He was on the street. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, or in hell, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus at his side. Or in his bosom, the, living, or the King James says. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish there. And besides all this, between us is a great chasm or a great gulf fixed, or a great canyon fixed between us, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able to, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, I send uh, uh, to send... Uh, Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that they may, uh, he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and they do not hear the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Part of the story was to convince people about the Pharisees and reveal their heart that Jesus rose from the dead and they still did not believe him. They had Moses and the prophets all those thousands of years and they could not decipher Jesus as the Messiah. But notice this, Jesus goes into the, these realities of hell through this story and I want to bring those out. The first thing is we see that number one, hell is real. Obviously that one of the realities of hell, it's real. Lazarus was a real story. He called him by name. Most of the time, Jesus said, well, there's this farmer, this guy, he, okay, I'm going to give you this illustration. But he named this man, and he said his name is Lazarus. This was a true story. This was a real story. And Jesus specifically mentioned names. He talked about Abraham. And not only that, but everything Jesus told in this story lined up with the Word of God. Everything that we see now in Revelation, everything that we see in the Old Testament, lined up with what the Bible describes as hell. Now, as you look at the definitions of hell, you'll see that there's three definitions of hell. I'm going to try to go through this quickly. Number one, Hades, as you see there, that was common. We kind of know that. The place where the wicked and the dead uh, reside and are punished. That's what Hades means. There's also another definition, a shoel, which means the grave, uh, or sheel. And then there's Gehenna. This is the most famous and most popular, most used Gehenna. Now, this is very interesting because uh, many people thought, well, they're, they're kind of all the same. Yeah, they are, but there's three descriptions. Now, when Jesus talked about this and he talked about hell and he gave these, these stories and he talked about these descriptions, he uses this illustration of Gehenna. This was actual place. It was a real place. So when Jesus talks about hell, he doesn't just talk about this figuratively place that maybe someday he's talking about a literal place what it was it was in Jerusalem in the southwest corner of Jerusalem was a, a place that years ago this was way back in the Old Testament you can read about it Manasseh's day and some of the other uh, evil kings day this is where they burnt people this is where they sacrificed people to the uh, unknown gods or the worldly gods secular gods Particularly the God of Molech, which where they would burn children and allow their children to pass through the fire. They would, they would uh, do human sacrifices in this valley, in this place. And this was a very steep valley. On either sides of this valley had very steep edges and very steep cliffs. So it was easy for them to dump people in there and throw people in there. But at the bottom of it was a fiery furnace. Um, and Isaiah describes it, uh, in Isaiah 30, he says, a horrible fire pit. That's how he describes it. It was called the Valley of Slaughter. That's what they, they did it. Well, by the time Jesus' day came, um, they really wanted to make a, send a message that we're not doing that anymore. We're not sacrificing people, and we're not, we're not sacrificing children. So what we want to do is we want to cover this place with garbage. And so this is where they threw their, this was their, kind of their, uh, you know, their, a transfer station, but what do you call it? They're, uh, you know, yeah, they're whatever it is. Whatever we have. I'm thinking about the words right now. Anyways, so this is where they would burn. But they had a fire going, so they would burn all the trash. And then they also threw criminals and a dead bodies of animals there. You know, the roadkill that people were, you know, the animals that were run over by donkeys and, and wagons. And they'd throw them in there and, and they'd burn them. The Bible says, uh, makes it clear. And it gives that definition. It was a place where they threw all kinds of rubbish and filth. And, and then and, uh, they, were, they were cast into this, this big pit. And it was 
uh, fire was burning in it all the time. They, that's how they got rid of stuff. And obviously, that's kind of how we'd get rid of trash today. So that's what they would do. So it was a horrible place. And it stunk like human bodies, or, or, or flesh rotting, I should say, or bodies burning. And it smelled like uh, fire. So trash burning. You, you know, it's just a really bad smell. And it was a really bad place to go. And Jesus said, this is like hell. Gehenna was a real place that Jesus could say that this is what hell is like. So he pointed to a real place. And all three of these definitions have things in common. It was a place for the dead, a a final residing place, a resting place for the dead. It had fire and there was suffering there. And you know, how, how many know that death happens every single day? It just happens. Just in America, we have uh, over uh, two and a half million people that die every year. There's that, that 7,000 people die every day. That's one person every 12 seconds die. Because the Bible says that one thing is for certain, that it's appointed once for men to die, and then the judgment. There's an afterlife. There's something that's coming later. There's another life. We're eternal beings. When God created us, He breathed His breath into us. He made us eternal beings. How many believe that? And there's also something we take in consideration that sin and death are a part of humanity. They're a part of humanity. We live in darkness. We're born in spiritual darkness. That's why we're born again and we come to the light. Come on, because when we're born again, our spirits are born again. The Bible says we're translated from death to life. Amen. We come out of darkness. We come out of death when we meet Jesus Christ. I like what John Bevere said in his book, Driven by Eternity. He said, people have been living in darkness so long, they have organized their life on that basis. And how many found yourself in darkness before you met Jesus? In fact, that's one of the things that I realized I'm lost in darkness without Jesus. That's what it's like to live in eternity without Jesus. Number two, we discover that hell is a place of fire. Luke chapter 16, verse 24, this man cried out and he said, I am tormented in this flame. Matthew 13, 42 and 50, Jesus said that people be cast into the fire or the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus also said in Matthew 25, depart from me, you cursed, unto everlasting fire. Revelation chapter 20 verse 15 says, Whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The word fire or hellfire is mentioned five other times just in the book of Matthew. Number three, we see that the reality of hell is that hell is a place of torment. Look in the story alone. Jesus said uh, three times and it talked about four times that there was a place of torment that this man went to. In, in hell, the Bible says he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, plural. I am tormented in this flame. This is a place of torment. It really doesn't matter how you break it down and you look at it. Uh, hell is a place of torment. It's not just a place in the Old Testament they believed that you would go to a place that where the dead abided, whether they were good or evil. That's where they went. Many people believe that this is Abraham's bosom where people went. There was, there was no noise there. You couldn't see anything. There was no feeling there. There was just a, a, a kind of you were just in a really pause type state. And, and, and then... But how many believe that Jesus descended into the lower parts of hell, the Bible says. And he freed those souls that were in that place. Now, through Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. When we die, we don't just go to a little kind of room with no paintings on the wall. And we just kind of stand there and wait for someone to light candles and pray us out of there. The Bible says that we go to the Lord. We go to meet Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Bible also says that you're going to... Go another place, and there's a place called hell. And it's really humanly impossible to comprehend the Bible's description of hell. It really does. It it, it just blows my mind. See, see, nothing on earth can prepare you enough for it. There's no, there's no crime scene that's, that's gory enough. There's no horror movie that's frightful enough. There's just no nightmare that you could have that would shake you to the core like the reality of hell. And that's what the Bible says. The Bible describes this in going through the story in Luke chapter 16. You will see it. You will be able to see. You will be able to smell it. You'll be able to hear. You'll be able to feel hell. In fact, uh, Psalms 9, 17 says that the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. You will literally become hell. Think about it. 
The Bible describes it as a place of weeping and wailing, gnashing of teeth, complete darkness, flames, pits, burning, fear, torments, everlasting punish. That word gnashing, it comes seven times it's mentioned in the New Testament, and it means to grind the teeth in an aggressive way because of the pain, frustration, and anger. Wailing and gnashing of teeth. See, I'm not trying to be moving you emotionally. I'm not trying to do this out of fear. I don't even have my preacher voice on. I could do that. I could get my preacher voice on. But I'm not doing that because it's just true. It's just reality. Amen? How many know what I'm talking about? We need to embrace this this morning. Because those that understand reality, understand uh, eternity, understand that there is a heaven to gain and there's a hell to shun. Is that right? Amen. And so that's what we believe. The number one thing about hell, as you read and study even in the Old Testament, there's one thing that you realize about hell. It could be have a lot of things in common, but one thing's for sure about hell that is really makes it hell. Is it the devil and the pitchfork? Is it the fire? Is it the flames? Is it the burning? No. This is what makes it so terrifying. Is it's the absolute absence of God's presence forever. That's what hell is. It's the absolute absence of God's presence. If you don't have God's presence, this is what you have. So in other words, it's void of God's life in any way. In this world, we can look around and we can think it's really bad, but take a look around. You can see God's handiwork in this world. Hell, there's not one piece of God there. Think about it. Wow. And that's what makes it so destructive and so hopeless. And that's what makes it so terrifying. It's the final separation from God. It's a complete separation from God. You will never be able to leave. You'll never be able to repent. You'll never be able to sing songs about God's goodness and go to church and, and talk to people and call somebody on the phone for counseling and help and prayer. You'll be all alone, the Bible says, without God forever. It's just the absolute, complete absence of God's love and God's presence. Aren't you glad that we have here on this earth? Aren't you glad that, as the Bible says in the book of Acts, that it, God's so near? We, let's, let's reach for God now that we can. Let, let's reach out to Him that we can right now. Let's do that. Amen. The fourth thing is, is that hell is forever. That's the reality of hell. It's forever. All who enter hell abandon all hope and the horror of hell. The horror of hell, even for one second... The Bible describes as unbearable. It's forever. Revelation chapter 14 verse 11 says this. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest night or day. Let me go through some, some scripture references about how the Bible warns us about the eternity and the permanence of hell. It says that hell is everlasting fire, everlasting punishment, everlasting chains, eternal damnation, eternal judgment, Eternal fire, this probably is going to be my most popular message. Come on, unquenchable fire, fire that can't be put out ever. Midst of darkness is reserved forever. The blackness of darkness forever, where their worm does not die. Why? Because there's so many bodies that he's feeding on, or so many things that are giving the worm life to feed on. That's what Jesus describes. It's like that. It's like bugs that come and feed on your body. They're never going to die. There's going to, it's going to be continual. There's going to be that torment of that. The final judgment. The Bible talks about it four times in the book of Revelation. It calls it the second death. The second death. How many know we're going to die, twi or die once? We want to die once. Is that right? Someone said this in his old saying. I think it goes like this. That if you die twice, or if you live once, you'll die twice. If you die twice, you'll live once. Amen. That's what it says. It says it's the second death. And it re refers to scriptures like the final judgment of the damnation, damnation of hell, resurrection of damnation, outer darkness. Notice something about the story of the rich man in hell in Luke 16, never even asked to get out. He only asked to be comforted. Why? Because he knew he could not get out. He knew there was no way out. He knew that he was there permanently. He knew it was eternal judgment on his life. So all he asked for was comfort. That's all he could ask for was to relieve him of pain. That's it. Think about it. Because he knew it was forever. Jesus warned us so much about it. He said in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, He said, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? Jesus took hell very, very serious. He said it'd be better to re lose your eye, to lose an arm or a foot, to have it cut off, than it would be to suffer in hell forever. Wow. 
And, and you know something that's, that's really, uh, uh, really uh, um, serious and sober about this is that this is real and this is happening right now. It's not something in a movie like years to, it may happen. or it, No, it's happening right now. Hell's been here for a long time. In fact, it was never created for people. It was only created for Lucifer and the fallen angels. Do you believe that? That's what the Bible says. So let me give you some present reality. Let's talk about some present reality when we talk about the reality of hell. Our pre present reality is that, number one, it's our choice. It's our choice. See, no angel, no demon, and even God himself will violate a person's will. Some of you are praying, God changed their will, changed their mind. He's not going to do it. See, that's why you know, people think, well, and any day I could wake up and I could be demon possessed. Never, he will never violate your will. Has to have an open door. Has to have a yes on your part. You have to be open. You have to receive it. Does everybody understand, right? So he'll never do that. Why? God did not even violate his own son's will. Jesus had to come to the place, not my will, but your will be done. Is that right? So if God is so loving, if God is so fair, if God is so loving and you talk about the love of God, why would God allow this? And I'll tell you why. Because man is a sinner by nature and by choice. We choose it. God is a God of love, but He's also a holy God. And it's that holy God, it's that holiness of God that demands payment for sin. That's what makes Him so just, by the way. Because there is a payment for sin. Or He wouldn't be just otherwise. He wouldn't be holy otherwise. He wouldn't be loving otherwise. Aren't you glad that there is a system? At least, maybe some of you really don't believe in the system anymore. But there is something, something small there in place in our, in our country that still does somewhat punish crime. <laughs> Maybe not as severe as you would like it, but aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that, that if somebody takes a life that there's punishment for that? What's that called? That's called justice. We have to look at hell as justice. It's just payment for our sin. You say, well, well no, that's, that's why we see as Christians the reality of hell because we understand how serious our sin is before God. How, how, how horrible it is before God. What is that pit like? What is that smell like? What is that wretched uh, pit like of that garbage that's burning? Well, that's sin. That's the payment of sin. That's what the Bible says, right? And so he's a just God. And, and because he's a loving God, because he is a just God, he has made a way of escape. That's what makes him so loving. That's what makes him so just. That's what makes him so fair. That he has provided a way of escape. Jesus said, I am the door. That's how you get it out of this thing, but that's how you get into eternal life is through the door. Let me just say this quote to you. God created the world of life and love. Man created the environment of sin and death. God created the world of life and love. He created that world. The Bible says God is love and He gives life. He created that world. Man created the environment for sin and death. Man created the environment for crime. Man created the environment for, for uh, uh, wronging other people and, and murder and lying and cheating and hate. Man created that environment. Come on, somebody. Our sin creates that environment. It actually breeds uh, this kind of environment for this to, to flow. See, this, this is the thing. We do not possess an inborn, natural, instinctive goodness. We just don't. I believe there's a want to in us. I believe that we can do good things, but ultimately we are not good to the core. Come on, somebody. We're not good. You say, well, I don't believe that, but I believe the Bible. And the Bible reveals who we are. How many know God created us and He knows us better than anybody else? And if God's Word says that's who I am and that's what I was before I was saved, then that's what I was. Come on. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6 says in all our members there is unrighteousness and lawlessness. The heart of man is deceitful, desperately wicked. Nobody knows it but the Lord, Jeremiah said. Jesus said in, Matthew, or in John chapter 3 that men love darkness rather than light. Men, humanity loves darkness rather than light. We took on sin's nature. 
We, we took on Lucifer's curse. Did you realize that? The curse that was meant for the devil and his angels because we disobeyed, because sin came into the world, we came under that curse. We took on that curse. The same curse that was on that snake in the garden, we took on that curse. But aren't you glad that Jesus broke the curse of sin, hell, death, and disease, amen, and gave us life and life more abundantly, amen. Jesus came to cleanse us from sin and give us a new heart. That's why we need a new heart. That's why we come to the Lord, because we, our heart is dark. You may say, well, I'm a good person. I give, give. I'm telling you right now, by nature, you're a sinner. By nature, there's, your, your, there's a part of your heart that's dark. Amen. See, the reality is that it's our fault, not God's. That's the reality, isn't it? That we brought, we brought on the curse. And you say, well, I, I wasn't born. I didn't do it. Adam did it. But you, you were born into it. But let me just say this. By choice, we sin. Don't act like we're so sweet and innocent all the time. By choice, we do those things. We're still, in, Paul said in Romans 7, we're still sin bent. We're still struggling with this thing. But how many know when we get a resurrected body, there'll be no more temptation. There'll be more, no more sin. There'll be no more struggle. Come on. That which is perfect has come. All that's going to be done away with. And so our sins, the Bible says, have separated us from God. In Luke 16, it says that there's a great canyon between us. You can't come here and I can't come there. That's permanent. That's permanent. People say, well, after I die, I think God's going to give me a chance to, to skip over. The Bible says there's a separation there between heaven and hell. And so the question uh, kind of comes up at this point. Well, would God send somebody to hell? Does God send somebody to hell? Was God, is He going to do that? Is He going to send somebody to hell? The answer would be yes, by their own choice. By their own choice. You choose hell when you reject Jesus, when you refuse God's love gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Let me look at the story in Luke 16 again. Ultimately, why did this rich man go to hell? Because he didn't give to the poor. Because he had a lot of things. Because they had nice clothes. Because he had rich. Nope, that's not why he went to hell. You'll see it in his conversation with Abraham. Number one, he said no to God. Even in his conversation with Abraham, he said no, Abraham, no. He said no, there's another way. Number two, he rejected the word of God. Notice what the Bible says. He said, go back and tell my brothers. He said, I've warned them of this place. And he said, you know what? They have Moses and the prophets. They have the word of God. So in other words, if his brothers had the word of God, he must have had access to the word of God. He rejected the word. He had the opportunity to make things right, live according to the commandments, live a selfless life. He daily said no to God. I believe that Lazarus was a way for him to soften his heart. I believe that beggar was there, put by God maybe, I don't know, or just found his way to his house. But it was a constant reminder that he needed to reach out of himself and go and extend himself to something else and somebody else. Love God with all your heart and love other people greater than yourself. He would have remembered the commandments. If he had fed Lazarus, if he had taken care of him, he would have practiced the Ten Commandments. He would have been reminded of the Word. He would have been reminded of God, but he said no. So that's what qualified him for hell. And what qualified Lucifer for hell? What, what gave him that? I mean, how did he go there? What qualified him? This was what the Bible describes, exaltation, arrogance, pride. That word there, literally pride, means to turn your back to, to stiffen your neck. That's why he did. And so when we say no to God, when we say no to the things of God, that's what we have to understand. What happens is we begin to say no to the opportunities to live in eternal life. Think about it. Jesus said there's going to be many that say to me, Lord, Lord, in that day, talking about the last day, maybe the day of judgment, uh, haven't we done all these good things in your name? And he said, I'm going to tell you, I don't know you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, of iniquity, sin. That's what he says. And later on he says, if you don't do what's written and you don't do my will, that you're going to be like this type of person that finds himself one day asking me to get in. You can't get in. So the second thing that we have, this present reality, not only do we have the choice that we have, but we also have the good news. That's the reality that we live in today. We have the good news. Jesus does not want anyone to go to hell. Listen to me. It's not His desire. The Bible says that, you know, Paul describes it, he said it, that none should perish. 
Nobody. No, not one. Not one person. How many believe that God knows everyone? All seven billion people on the earth and God has love in His heart for everyone. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. So well, I got a list of people that He, you know, can consider. But you know, the Bible makes it clear that He's given everybody a chance. The door is open to everyone. The door is open. The way has been made through Jesus for every soul. Think about it. So why is it that if God loves everybody and He's made the way for them to be saved, why aren't people just flocking to God? It's because of our sin, because of our pride, because of our choice. And how many know that the gospel kind of turns a light on us? It gives us another choice. You know, when you present the gospel to somebody, you're giving them another choice. You're giving them something to choose. You're giving them an, a, something to look at and to consider and an invitation. Okay, well, maybe I need to think about this. How many know if you don't have any choices, you're only going to make one choice? But if you gave somebody choices like, you know what? You don't have to live in darkness. You don't have to be addicted. You don't have to be broke and, and, and in, your, in your heart. You don't have to be, live this kind of life. There's another life. There's another way. Anybody listening? Amen? I hope this is all right. And so... The Bible says that hell was made for the angels, uh, the devil's angels. It was made for Lucifer and his angels. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. And he said it was prepared for the devil. It wasn't ever intended for man to go there. But because of the fall, because of sin, it created a place like hell. Think about it. Because of pride, it created hell. But the good news is that God is good, that God is loving, that God is a God of love, and He is a God of mercy, and He is a God of compassion and forgiveness and long-suffering and mercy. He's a God that cares. He's a God that knows. He's a God that it, it just moved in such a way by our, our condition that he, 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 he moved heaven and earth. Come on, He came down from heaven. And He hung on a cross for our sins. And He loves us so much. This is the good news that we can be free. We can conquer death, hell, and the grave. We can live a life without sin. We can live free from that torment of eternal death and hell. Amen? That's the good news. The good news is that we, have, we can have eternal life. The Bible says that God loved us when we were sinners. He still died for us. And this is the good news. That He paid the price. This holy God paid this price for us. This loving God is so amazing. Jesus died to save us from the wrath of God and the payment of sin, which is death and hell. He came to give us eternal life, as we talked about last week. And He overcame hell and death. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter was preaching, he said, because of God's great love, Jesus tasted death for every person. Jesus tasted death for every person. Jesus went into the lower parts of the earth so that we don't have to face eternal death without Him. Can you say amen? amen. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. Can we stand on our feet amen. in closing? I just want to share a couple things with you. Amen. You know, you have to ask yourself a question, don't you, when you talk about heaven and hell. What if Jesus was right? <laughs> what if Jesus is the Son of God? What if Jesus, everything he said was right? Say, so, well, the correct word for that, Brother Matt, is actually not an eternal hell. What if Jesus was right? Come on. Let's, you know, the LA Times did an article about 15 years ago of a lot of evangelical Christians and even some mainstream pastors, and they found that most people don't believe in eternal hell. They believe in some temporary Punishment, or, or not punishment, but separation. You'll just be separated. There'll be no fire, there'll be no flame, there'll be no suffering, there'll be no torment. But if you're eternally separated from God, how can you not suffer? How can you not be in pain? Come on, somebody, amen. Either way, we don't want that to happen. What if Jesus was right? Well, what if, no, what if he's right? What if all this stuff that we're doing in this church, in the Christian faith, and all these things through, done through centuries is actually right? Think about it. You wouldn't want to find out after you die. The best thing to do is, is to say, Lord, I repent of my sins. I turn from my sin and I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that you came 2,000 years ago, that you died on a cross for my sins. And I want to obey you and, uh, and be water baptized. And I want you to fill me with your spirit that I can be your witness in the earth. And I want to grow in my faith. And I want to talk to you daily and grow with a community that loves you so that one day when I die... I'll lift my eyes and see heaven, see Jesus, the one that died for me. 
Is that how you feel today? You can just say, Lord, I surrender today. I give it up. All my pride, all my excuses, all my sin. I just turn it over to you. Lord, you took it for me. I mean, Lord, I've, I've been hurt by people. I've been rejected. I've been, I've been betrayed. I've been, I mean, I've been on a long journey, and, and it's just gotten me further and further away from you. Today, with one prayer, I come right back to you, and I say, Lord, please. Amen. Don't take your spirit from me. I want to serve you. I want to live for you. Lord, not because I'm afraid of you, but because of your great love. Because I love you so much. I mean, this is about love, folks. This isn't about, you know, intimidating people and getting people scared to come to church. This is about love. It's about loving God so much that I want to see him face to face. That the original intent that God had for all of us in the very beginning is fulfilled in my life. Amen. That I'll live with him forever. You know, you can't sneak into heaven. You can't sneak into heaven. There's no back door. Today, the Lord wants you to make a bold confession of Jesus. Amen. Of faith in Jesus Christ. You can't just say, I'll get in whenever I want. I'll just, God knows me. I've done a good enough of good works. I'll just slip in. The Bible says there's not one righteous. No, not one. It's by faith. Come on. It's by faith that we believe in Jesus. Not by the works that we've done. And I want to encourage you as a Christian today that you need to share the truth. The reality of hell, share it in love, share it in joy, share it in boldness. But I understand that the Bible says it's everyone's going to face this day right here. Everyone. No one's exempt from it. And so what we want to do is we want, to, we want people to hear it as many times in their life as possible. Give them as many opportunities as possible. Give them as many choices as possible. Throw out the lifeline as much as we can, as much as we can. Well, they reject me. That's okay. Uh, that's okay. I'm going to continue to give out that line of hope, that, that, that line of, of salvation. Come on, somebody. Amen. Maybe you're thinking about somebody today, one of your relatives or, amen, somebody that you really love. Come on, we want to see them in heaven, don't we? Come on, we want to see them in heaven. We want to see them, amen, face the judgment seat of Christ with a smile on their face when Jesus says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen. Today, if you're not born again and you don't know where you're going to go when you die. Maybe you say, I have good works, but it's not based on good works. You can't work your way to heaven. It's by grace. Just receive what Jesus did at Calvary. Say, Lord, I'm going to live for you all the days of my life. Amen. If that's you today, amen, maybe we can bow our heads and amen today and just pray and ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins. Ask the Lord to, amen, just, just forgive you of pride and, and arrogance and independence from God. And, and, and taking up your own cause and being so concerned about your own life and hating other people and, and all the anger and lust and all those things going on and realize that Jesus died to pay for those things. And he's the only way to heaven. And turn away from your sin and turn to God wholeheartedly. If that's you today, just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. Lord, I ask you to cleanse me and come into my life and make me new that I may be your child and live forever in heaven with you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen and amen. How's it going, church family? This is Michael. Thank you for joining us today. If you like what you saw, please hit that subscribe button and then also click the bell notification with all the notifications on so that you can be informed on every time we post new content. The Lord's placed it on your heart to give today. You'll find that link down in the description below. Your gift, no matter how big or small, helps us as a church reach our community in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for joining us. We love you. We appreciate you. We'll see you next time.